I've organized the uh, presentation into three parts, and I've also written a paper on it, so you will have uh, both of them for uh, more information. So the first part is about cybersecurity, then something on the key points on uh, 5G, and then conclusions on how I think a country can be safe at the same time reach the maximum level of prosperity. Since I was given this role of uh, CSO, I spent about three months in studying uh, laws, regulations, and uh, deliverables of the main actions, ongoing especially, yeah, globally, but uh, in Europe, Germany, and the UK, as well as in Australia. Now, if we look at um, some of the recent reports we got from uh, European Commission, in particular, the extensive analysis that made on the root cause categories of the telecom security incidents over seven years, we came out uh, with those uh, conclusions. So the first conclusion you may see here that uh, the main problems are linked to system failure. So hardware and software failure strictly related to the quality of the elements. The second issue is linked to human errors. And then incidents are of, uh, due to natural uh, phenomena. And only the 4%, so the minimal part of them, are linked to malicious actions. And when they have explored what kind of actions are behind those, they found that two-thirds of those are denial of service attacks, and then the rest are just uh, physical damages, because I think in Europe, in Italy, for example, they steal copper. <laughs> so that's the reason. And the main conclusions drawn out of this uh, in-depth study it was that the flag of origin, so the label you're having on the equipment, it is decoupled from the incidents. So the flag of origin, it's not a major concern. It was confirmed in the Europe, in the studies, as well as in the UK, but also, interestingly, it was confirmed by the Australian Cybersecurity Centre. So by reading the guidance they published um, in July, sorry, in June, and you may find uh, clearly stated here, this is a document uh, produced by uh, the government agency to the practitioners um, targeting the telecom supply chain. It states clearly that it is usually simpler to compromise another product or service in the supply chain without lawful interference. So basically, what they're saying here, they recognize that for a country, it's much easier to penetrate equipment made elsewhere than produced by the country themselves. And uh, now, looking overall uh, into the major concerns, um, we have that uh, identified that the uh, telecom supply chain, it is uh, one of the things that uh, uh, causes uh, the uh, major concerns at uh, state and national level. And uh, the telecom supply chain, I also taken this definition from uh, the Australian Cybersecurity Center. It encompasses many things. So it includes the design, manufacture, delivery, deployment, support, the commission, equipment, other and software services that are utilized within an organization, uh, cyber ecosystem. And uh, it must consider the whole life of a particular ICT product um, or a service in an organization. And uh, uh, if you go uh, more into the detail, along with the uh, telecom supply chain, my recommendation is to have a look at this document that was uh, produced by the UK government that discloses the reason why it's so important to uh, uh, ensure the resiliency of uh, the uh, telecom supply chain. And in particular, uh, when we look at uh, another um, uh, study, 
made available uh, by the European Commission that was uh, last month, where they have consolidated the different views and feedback received from the 27, actually 28, including the UK member states. The main conclusions were simply two, that uh, the key assets, like uh, Franco presented earlier, uh, uh, mostly vulnerable, say, in the telecom supply chain, are uh, three parts of the network. Basically, it is the core network functions and then the network uh, functions, uh, uh, virtualization, so wherever the virtualization applies, and in particular, again, our uh, network function, the core network, and then the uh, management and orchestration of the functions themselves. And the main vulnerability that it was identified still in the telecom supply chain was the overdependency of any one supplier. So that has been the main issue identified in the consolidated report confirmed in the UK. Why so important? Because being overdependent on a single supplier, your network becomes basically vulnerable. So it, you are losing, missing out resiliency, and then uh, what happened also is that, uh, in particular, if uh, anything happened within the system, it's very, very difficult to maintain the business uh, continuity. It's pretty much like putting all your eggs into one basket. And uh, similar conclusions were drawn by the five eyes, and as I have here summarized, we have to, it is a need to ensure the supply chains are truly trusted and they are reliable, and we need to shift towards a risk-based evaluation and evidence-based risk assessment. So we need to shift towards a way of risk mitigation and transparency overall. Then, in particular, I was extremely interesting. The conclusions uh, uh, drawn after the panel and the hearing in the UK against Huawei, where they interviewed uh, professors, they interviewed the vendors, and in particular, they uh, um, um, discussed with the carriers uh, in the UK. Where, and then out of this, the two committee, the Science and Technology Committee, and Intelligence Security Committee of the Parliament, they drew uh, an important conclusions that for the carrier network to be resilient um, uh, of, of any attack, it could be an internal attack or external attack, that basically can be best achieved by two things. First, we need to reduce the overdependence from any one single vendor. And that is necessary, as I said earlier, to introduce resiliency, to make the network resilient. That's the key point, that you can detect a problem and immediately react, for example, by swapping that particular technology. The second, we must have in place competition. And only by having competition, we can make sure that the um, 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 commercial priority do not overcome, do not go over investments, especially on cybersecurity. So those were the most important conclusions drawn by those uh, committees. Now, if you look at other activity ongoing in Europe, we have now uh, finalized, they have now finalized the uh, risk assessment. The next step for them by the end of this year is to output a toolbox for mitigations. And then later, starting for next year and uh, uh, for the year to come, they will put in place a certification uh, framework. And at the time of speaking now, we have a close collaboration between uh, the European Commission, in particular ENISA, that's the Agency of Cybersecurity, Information Cybersecurity, and the industry, so that means the 3GPP security as uh, assurance uh, uh, specs, and the GSMA um, looking at uh, um, 
uh, network equipment, the security assurance scheme. So by combining the effort of governments, policymakers, and the industry, Europe will achieve a very clear way forward that will make sure the telecom supply chains will be truly resilient and will incorporate transporting equipment through risk mitigation, transparency, and certifications. Now, that's basically what's going on globally. Looking at the 5G, why this technology is so important. We have recently um, 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 reviewed and collaborated into a comprehensive study where the following conclusions uh, came out. So the technology, it is the fundamental enabler of the fourth industrial revolution. And here you have example of uh, the benefits in terms of uh, GDP growth, which is expected more than 5.3% in the, within uh, 15 years. And uh, also the impact on the healthcare costs and we see a massive reduction in cost by the introduction of this particular technology by looking, for example, at the, um, uh, the aging problem. Uh, we can reuse the robotic platform to help old people uh, remain active and independent and massively reduce the cost of care. At the same time, you may see the new fresh technology. I will show you how it has been designed. We reduce dram dramatically the um, CO2 uh, emission. And here it is quantified also based on the speed of deployment. So the faster you are rolling it out, of course, uh, the better is to achieve the maximal uh, benefit. And also we have massive benefit into the digital spillover as written here across all sectors. And in particular, the benefits are tangible uh, to the uh, manufacturing in, uh, in, uh, within uh, the, uh, the 10 years. Now, if you look at the technology, how the technology will evolve, it has been designed into three main phases. So from release 15 down 16 and 17, supporting different type of use cases. So first of all, the um, Internet of Things, so the uh, um, uh, IoT in general, as is and will be kept and supported by the evolution of the LTE. So this first release was already finalized in uh, 2017, and the narrow band and uh, machine type of communication technology will be far enhanced, staying still into the LTE path. At the same time, will come and, and be deployed the new radio. The new radio, it's uh, an announcement of the LTE uh, um, uh, technology much more flexible, it allows us to use pretty much all spectra. And the first use case will enhance the mobile broadband experience. This is followed by connecting robotic platforms in terms of ultra reliable or latency communication services. And we are now discussing the standard how to simplify further the new radio so that we have a, a technology in place which uh, basically is capable of uh, solving all the problems, and uh, the performance are basically um, um, on average, as you see here. Uh, um, say, uh, uh, not good at anything, but uh, resolving all the problems. So you may see here that the first is uh, the enhanced mobile broadband will be uh, especially increasing the speed and then uh, the ultra-reliable or latency, uh, uh, tec the technology that will be announced to meet those particular user scenario will be extremely good at reducing the end-to-end -end latency and will be really reliable, but I mean, not taking care much about the coverage of costs. And then the new radio will be something that in somehow tends to meet all the possible requirements and the uh, special application we'll have will be on the industrial internet. Those things, and earlier you saw the uh, benefits um, in manufacturing. Okay, now a couple of words about uh, the uh, technology, how the technology will evolve, 
As uh, Mark mentioned earlier, I don't know why, I mean, we tend still saying that uh, the radio axis blurs into the core, which is uh, basically incorrect uh, in all senses. It is incorrect by design. You may see here the system uh, will evolve. So you start from a 4G system, so 4G core, the LTE as an axis. The first thing we will plug here is a base station that will work new radio in parallel with the existing station in dual connectivity and all the signaling will remain through the, uh, uh, the current system. And here will be just an additional uh, pipe of data connecting with the existing network. So the system here is uh, 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 separated as, as it was. So Huawei uh, baseband unit is, uh, is exactly the same box as uh, the LTE station. Then uh, things will evolve with the introduction of the uh, 5G core and the 5G core is uh, and remain uh, separated from, from the RAN and they will keep evolving in, uh, in, uh, in parallel. So here you do have the timelines. This system has been already standardized all in two versions or configurations in release 15 and then the protocols, the interfaces and other functionality will be announced in release 16 to support two terrible religious communication services. And then at later time, as I said earlier, we will be able to integrate many, many, many more things up to one million of connection per square kilometer. Yes, um, the security um, of 5G has been announced further with respect to the early generation. And uh, here you have examples of uh, assets and possible threats, and then how those threats are uh, mitigated and uh, the risks um, reduced is simple by introducing new technologies, a new way, and the support of uh, best practices that make this uh, system really resilient to any internal or external attacks. For example, some of the functions that have been uh, further announced with the introduction of 5G is that now the communication is uh, encrypted, including the user plane in its integrity here, that was a problem in LTE. We do have now encryption and protection between public land mobile networks so when the uh, end user founds himself to be in the roaming, we have the communication now encrypted. They have introduced a unified way of authenticating the end users uh, independent of the type of access. So what we have now that the 5G core, it is a one core for everything and anything. And then the encryption key has been further uh, enhanced up to 250. Uh, six uh, bits. Then at the same time, TGPP provided guidance on the cybersecurity uh, deployment. So we have two aspects. One is the uh, security functions and the architecture and then the deployment that has to be done on top. So what the TGPP uh, recommends is to the introduce security gateways between elements, TGPP elements and firewalls for controlling the access, and for example, if you look at how the Huawei network are deployed, we also introduce here firewalls and bastion hosts so that the communication between the element management system and the network itself is completely transparent and under control. I've explained all this, these details in the paper, so out of the paper uh, uh, you may find uh, much more information. What I would like to stress here is that the cybersecurity overall is a complex uh, problem. And in order to um, address, mitigate, and solve this, we need to constantly work together. So all the stakeholders are supposed to give a contribution. So it's not just about the vendor. So I say the vendor is responsible of introducing and supporting all the possible functions and um, measures that are specified in the standards plus enhancing them. 
Then you do have the carriers and basically the operators that are responsible for the uh, deployment and to operate properly the network, which means that if we have the best security functions in the network and then you forget them to activate or you forget to change the password, you are leaving <laughs> doors open, you are introducing vulnerability that can be then exploited regardless. So we need to work together in that sense. Application security has to be enabled. So anytime you use any kind of application, you, make, you have to make sure that the communication is encrypted between the two PN entities. At the same time, we need to work with the government with the proper the regulatory framework in place and standards organization so that we can constantly announce the functions of the system and introduce certifications and risk mitigations and transparency measurement aligned so that the entire ecosystem can be secure uh, and uh, can be made trustworthy. So just quickly about uh, example of uh, how the system has been uh, 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 developed uh, at Huawei. So we are really clear on what the 5G is, where the interfaces are, and where the benefit um, uh, lies. So you do have an end-to-end -end system which consists of the access, and then you have the core element, including the mobile edge computing element, which is nothing else than an application function of the core network, and then you have the central data center where the, the uh, control plane of the core network uh, resides plus uh, other application function or other platforms like uh, IoT platform or application enablement platform. And here you have any kind of device. So this is basically the physical architecture of a 5G system. And you may see how that has been completely redesigned by our organization with the target to reach the lowest cost per, bit per kilometer. So you do need to have fiber in place and depending on the technology to reach a uh, terabit speed or gigabit speed um, into the backhauling. So that means the communication between the axis and the edge. This is a fundamentally important to have fiber in place, like the challenge we are having now, for instance, in Australia, because uh, we need to reach speed of at least 10 gigabit per second per site initially, but ideally Per, um, per cell, so per sector. And uh, we have already started a massive deployment globally. As of today, Huawei um, shipped, so that means not within China, but uh, to, to leave China. So outside China shipped more than 400,000 base stations. I'll give you a uh, a number, I think, uh, we, we would need uh, around 10,000 to cover all Australia. And uh, examples of deployments outdoor are in the UK, already the communication in place working in six plus cities and with only 40 megahertz spectrum in dual connectivity, one of the configuration I showed earlier, or known standalone system, we have managed to achieve peak of a gigabit uh, per second and on average uh, uh, 500 uh, megabit per second, which is a, an excellent uh, experience. Um, at the same time, we have already achieved massive deployment of indoor system. And for example, that's uh, the uh, Beijing New Airport, where we have deployed more than 2,000 um, nodes. This is the node, it is a, it is a small cell and now already carrying traffic of more than 45 million uh, users. So our organization has constantly, constantly invested on uh, cybersecurity, and here you may see uh, the many certificate, common criteria we comply, so we, we tend to test all equipment, and where is possible, we attain an external certificate. And here you may also see the contribution we are having within uh, the standards as rapporteurs and as well as the uh, fixtures that our system currently supports. This is a summary 
of uh, the security portfolio that we are making available to our uh, uh, carriers or anyway to our customers. Here you have the list of the threats and above you may find the NIST best practices for network resiliency which is about identify, protect, detect the particular attack, respond and recover, so detect and respond. It is about uh, network resiliency. And here you do have all the possible features. You can be supported, something coming directly from uh, 3GPP, others enhanced by our organization. So, a couple more slides to conclude. And uh, I have just two uh, recommendations because my experience is uh, of about two years now. Uh, in Australia, but I have developed uh, all my skills and um, experience uh, in Europe. So, come from Italy, but I spent 10 years in Finland when I was running the R&D for Nokia, and then in Munich here, Germany. Behind this link, you have one of my talk at the uh, European Parliament, and there was about 10 years with Huawei. Yeah, in Munich I was uh, heading the Center Research Institute. So the first thing what I recommend is we need to be able to attract investments. So Oceania currently, so meaning uh, Australia and New Zealand haven't been able to attract any substantial investment from our organization. And uh, I've been struggling on that. So as long as we are not finding a good will together with the government, I myself and my colleagues, not only here, but also in HQ, are enabled here to bring any kind of investment. And that is necessary if we want to remain competitive. And not only miss 5G, we are also currently tending to miss out 6G as well, because the research, for example, my ex team members in Munich are really doing that. And when I relocate here, in Australia, it was my target, remains my target, to build up here an R&D center. So we need to find a way to attract investments. Only within the European Research Center, we invested, um, um, this is a budget of uh, uh, a few years back, more than 400 million euro per year. And I would like now to find a way to bring a part of these investments in Oceania. But in order to achieve this, we need to find an ecosystem of willingness, especially uh, from governments, uh, to work together. The second thing, so investment is first, in which demands for also competition. No competition in place, no investment. The second uh, message I would like to <coughs> deliver today is we need to shift from an unconditional ban which is currently applied, I think, um, only in Australia, uh, which is about a power direction uh, that bars um, carriers uh, uh, from uh, buy uh, uh, Huawei equipment to a risk mitigation, transparency, and certification approach. And here we have already started massively investing into this. You have examples of evaluation center we start from our independent cybersecurity laboratory in Shenzhen that was set up um, a few years back, independent from product lines. So each product, from mobile, equipment, and anything, has to pass through this uh, verification and validation system before it is commercialized. It's to comply to any low regu regulations uh, you may find at the destination, the final destination of this product. So we tend now to mirror this model like uh, we have been doing now in the UK, but also launched in Brussels, uh, so that we are able to uh, support the customer, and create an ecosystem of innovator to seriously looking into the network elements, look at into the software, and uh, together find potential vulnerability and think about uh, about solution and inject and improve the standards. I hope that is gonna be also another actions that will be 
finally welcomed by, by the government here and, uh, and uh, help us uh, move forward. So that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you. And uh, here you are having um, a summary which um, says what I have already repeated uh, many times. So to me, the mantra for Oceania to move forward is uh, simply competition and uh, investments. You may only attract investments if you do have a fair competition in place. No competition is bad for everybody. And I always give the example of the pizza. And this is what I do to my students. I gave a few lectures at the University of Sydney and uh, the business school in New South Wales. I was also in Melbourne at Executive MBA. In no competition regime, what happens is that you will have only a single restaurant and this restaurant will be provided only pizza. If there is no competition, I will give you only margarita. And if no competition, I will give you the pizza with only the remainings of the early day because you will eat it that regardless. And look at me as a provider. I will reduce the personnel. Although I am providing you the pizza, I don't need too many people to make a margarita. So what I do locally, I reduce my organization and myself come from Europe to have a good vacation in Australia or in New Zealand and enjoy life at the expenses of the number of jobs that are reduced locally. Thank you so much for hosting us today. Thank you. Yes, so um, there are uh, um, w the measurements you find in this report, which I'm happy to share, because we have made them uh, available, so I'll go a little back, are strictly related to each single component and how the component has been designed, the particular technology, and so forth. Now, if you look at the system here, it's been completely uh, redesigned. So we use the fiber and... Um, each component here, we have reduced the maximum level of conversions, electricity optical conversions. So we, and then each data center, now we run the AI, so we switch off all the <laughs> resources we don't use. It. So that is strictly, that parameter there is strictly linked to the equipment and how the system is managed, organized. So the energy or and cost per bit per kilometers have been massively reduced. And you may find um, behind the links uh, you, you have in the paper, for example, or how the system has been optimized. Then the other impact on, um, if I go back, on manufacturing was linked to revenues. So the, you mean this one here, right? So that's, that's strictly related to the system itself. It does not consider that now you may have more productions, therefore uh, the emission overall increase. That's not the link to that. So this is strictly related to the system because the system of all, the node generation system is extremely costly and consume a lot of energy. So I think the electricity bill is one of the most expensive things carrier has to pay. So that, that's the reason. This is a study made to look into the, what the particular application you may use now through a low latency, ultra reliable communication, very high speed to improve your business processes and therefore increase productivity. So at the given number of inputs, you have many more outputs by using, for example, augmented reality, or experts, remote uh, control, precision, monitoring, control, and so forth. So that the two things are uh, decoupled. Yeah. Yes. No, 
I mean, the solution is to uh, uh, go towards uh, uh, risk mitigation and uh, transparency process. So the suggestion is to look into all elements regardless the label you are having on it. As simple as that. So transparency going for like done in the UK, we could establish here evaluation centers under the control of the government with third party experts and then look into the elements, anything you are putting in place that meets two things. First, meets the requirements of the standards that all features and functions are supported, possible certifications, but then we make sure that there are no vulnerabilities once the network is deployed. So we need to evaluate the products, the solution, and the business processes of the carriers. That's the point. No independent or labels placed on it, yes. The problem we are having, the, uh, I'm not, um, uh, maybe the, uh, Rob can comment on, I can give you an Australia, the Rob, or Rob, is there Rob? Yeah. Thanks, David. So for my sins, I'm the New Zealand cybersecurity officer, so David's officer. I'm to answer your question, actually, um, New Zealand is, a, is technology hungry, right? It's, it's, it's actually, if you look back historically, um, our network operators took seven years for a return on investment on 3G when they introduced 3G. They actually introduced 4G four years later. So they hadn't even paid for 3G before they invested in 4G. Likewise, they're not going to have paid for 4G by the time 5G launches. Um, actually, our network operators are looking at multi-vendor solutions. And you're absolutely right. It is going to be an expensive solution for them because the marketplace is not big enough if we consider we're a country of 4.8 million people, of which maybe 3 million use the networks. Um, that's not a huge investment return, considering there are three networks here with possibly a fourth on its way. So we really don't know how that's going to play, but certainly the diversification of using multiple vendors is being looked at by the industry at the moment. Um, in regards to the investment in 5G and New Zealand and Australia, both countries are seen as strategically important for the company. Um, and clearly, as David showed earlier, um, we have an organization known as the Five Eyes, which are very important to us, of which New Zealand and Australia are members. So um, the investment of the company in um, New Zealand and Australia are, is almost um, unprecedented. Um, we certainly invest an awful lot more in our considerations for these two countries than we do, shall we say, in Europe. Um, and we come with our own idiosyncrasies here in New Zealand. So it's not only about um, the technology, but also the physical infrastructure as well. Um, if we consider, and I speak from experience because my past role was to roll out a mobile network here in New Zealand, um, try putting a massive MIMO antenna on a street pole. It's not going to happen because A, the law doesn't allow us to do it here, but B, the pole will fall over because we happen to have quite high winds here in, uh, in New Zealand and, and in Australia. So then we have to consider how do we do that? So that R&D work is not only about the technology, it's about actually how do we physically make this work? And you then have to consider all of that infrastructure piece. So um, the investment here is, is a huge focus for us. Now, two years ago, we announced in New Zealand that we'd invest $400 million in the infrastructure and, and research and development here in New Zealand. We are doing that actively with, uh, with the universities at the moment, and we're partnering with a number of universities here looking at that. Um, yes, sir. Absolutely. So that's just one of the approaches that David is taking. All right. And, and we, we are talking actively at the moment with the authorities about how do we develop that a little further. 
Um, th- there's, there's a price to pay for that. And as David said, we need, we need to attract that investment. Um, the offices have to pay their way to attract that investment from the organisation. But we also have to get the agreement of all of the industry leaders, so not only the network operators, but also those that create legislation, um, to support that as an activity. And that, that can be quite difficult. Okay? Ind- industry and legislative practice tends to be opposing of each other quite often. So we're working very hard with that as an organisation as well. Finished. Maybe one word just um, about Australia, if you allow me, so because uh, everybody probably is curious. And so we, s- I relocate to Australia because my target, as I, s- um, I, I reported to the press back in 2015, was to build an R&D center here in Oceania. So that point is we have currently evaluated the potential. Now let us speak to um, uh, Australia only. The potential of Australia in terms of knowledge and uh, skills and the prominency and eminency of professor is as good and even better than, than Canada. That's what we have found. And uh, so my expectations, and I do see willingness in HQ to have an equivalent amount of investments uh, done here as well. So what, what, what we need to have in place now, like Rob says, is the, that the government is keen on uh, welcoming uh, our, our contribution, especially at the uh, uh, federal level. Yeah, once that is in place, I think it's going to be very easy to assemble those capabilities here and start looking into a concrete problem from cybersecurity down enhancing 5G, 6G, anything. Yeah, because all ecosystem is there, but it's fragmented, and investments are not coming, especially due to lack of competition. No competition, no investment by any one vendor. No way, they will not invest. No competition, why should they invest? For what? You eat my pizza regardless, so you ought to have margarita on. Thank you.